Welcome everyone to OLS 5 week four. Um, as we begin this call, just um, a reminder that uh, our engagement here is um, governed by our code of conduct and communicate community participants participation guidelines, um, the link to which you can find on line 89. Um, be nice, keep the call safe and be welcoming. If you experience or witness any unacceptable behaviors or have any other concerns, please do report this to um, any one of the organizers here at team at openlifesci.org. Or if um, you'd like to report to us individually, um, because you know the matter you're reporting concerns one of us, um, please feel free to reach out to us via our individual emails. Um, these are our first names, so Berenice, Malvika, Yo, and Emmy, at openlifesci.org. All of them you can find on line 91 of the Etherpad. Um, and also, uh, for those of you who are new to our calls as well, um, we have uh, otter.ai trans automatic transcription available um, on this call. So if you do wanna follow along on the transcription, you can click the button that says live on otter.ai on the top left corner of my screen, um, <laughs> or maybe top right for you. Um, and um, there's also a link to the transcript as well. If, if that's preferable, we can use that. Um, one more sort of housekeeping thing. Um, we are gonna have breakout rooms today. so. Um, we'd like to know how you prefer to interact with others in the breakout rooms. Um, if you could rename yourself on Zoom, the way you do that is you hover over your own image. There'll be sort of three dots that are popping up um, on the top right, at least for me, um, and then click that, click rename, and um, put a W in front of your name if you would like to participate in the written reflection-based exercise in the breakout room, or S for spoken, so you have a spoken discussion in that breakout room. And this will really help us um, put you in the right room when we head into the breakout rooms. And exciting news, we have a vote and a result on our OLS5 cohort name. Um, I'm really excited about this and it's such a beautiful name. You have voted for HOPE. So cohort HOPE, welcome. And just, you are all such an inspiring bunch. Um, this is fantastic. And we'd like to ask actually, if you could share with us, especially those you know who are, uh, know other marvelous languages, um, what does hope mean in a language that you know or you speak or you write in? Um, let us know below. It also, I think this also applies to like, you know, let us know what your, what hope is in your own language. And um, yeah, if there are, if there are more, hope, more, more words than hope that means sort of, along the lines of hope, like that would be really interesting as well. <laughs> um, crowdsourcing this, really exciting, but I hope you like it and I definitely do love. Um, so cohort hope, um, I'm wondering if um, anyone who is your first time here on a live cohort call, um, reason I'm asking is we'd love you to introduce yourself to the rest of the cohort and us to have a chance to get to know you. I'm um, just going to pause for a second. Um, you can, um, oh, I see a list actually. Huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> missed that for some reason. Um, but, but yeah, uh, if your name is not currently on that list under line 109, please do add yourself and, uh, or you can let us know in the Zoom chat as well. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, if Sarah, if we start with you, if you'd like to introduce, you know, your name, your location, and maybe a recent hobby and a project. Sure. Uh, my name is Sarah Stamps. I am an associate professor of geophysics at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia in the US. Uh, a recent hobby of mine. Oh my goodness. You know, I'm going to share one of my husband's. So he has gotten involved in woodworking, which has been for a long time and now has a collection of hand planes. It's a new hobby. Lots and lots of hand planes. I'm like, you go for it. It makes you happy. I mean, literally like a hundred hand planes. It's pretty amazing. Well, they'll get resold, but you know, it's a hobby that's just come into my world pretty recently. Sorry, it's not mine. I'm cheating. <laughs> but um, as far as projects, I lead a $3 million project called Dryer. It's called Dry Rifting in the Albertine Rhino Robin. And I also um, lead another project called TZ Volcano which is a developing uh, volcano observatory in Tanzania. 
Marvelous, thank you. Um, next we have Evelyn. Hi, I'm, um, it's Evelyn actually, but uh, Sorry. it's fine, thank I get you. it all the time. Evelyn. Um, I live in the UK and, well, I live in Coventry, but I work for the University of York um, on a project called CloudSpan, uh, which is about developing training resources for uh, doing like big data analysis using the cloud, basically for biologists. Um, and my most recent, I've been, I've been knitting for quite a while, but recently I've been knitting a jumper for my nephew, um, who is, was born in January. So it's really small and cute. I've been enjoying doing that. Oh, wonderful. We have, we have a few um, key knit knitters here as well. So uh, knitting club, or less. <laughs> um, Maya? Um, hi, everyone. I'm Maya. Um, I live currently in País Vasco in Spain. Um, I'm here in the role of facilitator for the calls and also as a mentor um, for a great team and hobbies. I don't have really so many, but I think recently I started decorating cakes for birthdays uh, for my family because they're all born in March. And usually they ask for dinosaurs. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, Maya. And we'll see, we'll hear from, we'll hear your voice and your, your facilitation, benefit from your facilitation, yeah, throughout the call and in the future as well, and also all last five. So um, um, yeah, I'm really happy to have you here. Um, Alessandra. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alessandra Candian. I live in Leiden uh, in the Netherlands um, and I am part of the two person team. So my uh, co person is uh, Lisanne and we work together for uh, creating this uh, massive online open course that is called about open science and where we want to inspire people to, you know, to understand the, the uh, nice things about open science and possibly become contributors to the open science movement. Uh, well, about hobbies, I've been many hobbies in my life. The, maybe the latest one is running. So I was, I never liked running, but with the uh, COVID, uh, I've become a, a runner. So now I run 10K. Thank you. Beautiful. Yo's just been in a run this morning. So. <laughs> We were saying that it, you know, running really gives the endorphins sometimes. Um, so yeah, glad to have you here. And last but not least, Hanieri. Uh, my name is Hanieri. I'm based in Hong Kong. Before I was in the UK, that that was when I met Yo and Ovika and Amy and Berenice. Uh, doing a PhD at the moment uh, as a hobby, mostly cooking during the evenings. So. That's me. That's back to Amy. Thank you, Hanire. And we look forward to hearing from your talk later. All right. Um, I hope that's everyone who hasn't had a chance to introduce themselves. But um, uh, very nice to meet you all. And uh, yeah, I'll hand over to Maya for the next session. All right. So we are starting um, with an interactive uh, exercise experience in which we will reflect in small groups on our previous experience on working open. Therefore, um, uh, now Amy would uh, put you in the breakout rooms and we would invite you to think about a uh, first story, a time when you were collaborating or working on an open project and it was a complete train wreck. And uh, what we want you to discuss is to to share what happened, what made it chaotic uh, in the first place. And the second story, um, we invite you to think of a time when you were collaborating or working uh, on an open project and everything was just in place and perfect. So again, you know, what happened, what was there and what made it sublime? Um, we are at the lines one uh, to three uh, and the questions are also in the chat box. Um, how Amy, are we ready yet? This is a little bit trickier than I thought, but um, I'm going to give this a go. And folks who um, hasn't indicated your preference, um, if you could um, let me uh, jump out of the room <laughs> and let us know if we, I put you in the wrong room and you'd like to be, you know, in the written or in the spoken room. 
Um, but otherwise, it's okay. And facilitators don't join the rooms. You've been accidentally assigned, but just don't join them. <laughs> all right, I'm opening all the rooms, hopefully. Hi, sorry. <clears throat> Can I? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, I joined late. We had a lab meeting that ended um, now, basically. And so, yeah, I'm just not sure whether I was assigned to a room. Probably not. Uh, but yes, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> sorry. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> no worries. Um, if you are not, then um, I've actually just uh, accidentally closed all the rooms. <laughs> No so everyone might be um everyone might be coming back sorry technical yeah glitch. next one <laughs> um but i've only been doing online calls for about a week or so so i forgot i needed to unmute uh <laughs> just joking um right um i hope you all had some good conversations in the breakout rooms uh we are going to talk now about a lot of the different uh, little files uh, that you can create to actually help welcome people into the projects that you may be working on. Uh, so this is writing out processes and ways to do things that are useful for people. Um, I know that Hanyeri has just said he's got a Zoom problem and he needs to restart. Uh, so, oh, are you back? Yes, again. Excellent. I was just going to figure out how I could stall for time. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> my camera amazing. had to kind of clash it when it was leaving the breakout rooms. So, uh, so I should start. Yeah. Uh, so okay. um, please take it away. And um, Hanya is going to be talking about readmes. Uh, okay. So once you have a new shine hammer uh, or a golden hammer as they say you might think that everyone is unable to use your hammer unfortunately that's not always the case so that's why uh readme is important and we'll be talking a little bit more about what a readme is so uh just to acknowledge most of the information here in part comes from previous iteration of this presentation by Alex Chen. So what is the Redmi's Orange? It goes back to uh, the 1970s uh, when computer was kind of just starting and people were still sharing uh, files by tapes and other methods. Uh, this was close to where the Unix system was being developed and the readme kind of starts to being adopted by the whole Unix uh, developers uh, on all the small programs. And from the Unix, you might know the GNU project that is a big part of all the Linux distributions these days. And this uh, is a code from the coding standards from the GNU project. And it explicit mention a readme file that should include the name of the package, the version, and the description. So this is has all old in some sense. Uh, so readme files, they have the name readme, as you might have imagined. There's a few different spellings ish. So readme with a space read.me, readme.txt, readme.md, readme.rst, readme.asc, readme.wik. They all plain text files uh, with a few different uh, formatting. So how uh, is a readme? So just a small example. Uh, this comes from the GNU compiler. Uh, so it's very short with me. I break in three uh, slides. So it starts with some information of what is the, uh, the project. So in this case, the GNU comp uh, compiler collection has a few information about saying that it's a free software and what's the copyright and some information about manuals. Later, it tells how to install the GNU compiler and Later, a few other information about versions. And later, it points to where to report bugs and has a final copyright notes about the own readme itself-ish and all the other files. So 
as I say, this is a uh, very old project as part of the GNU uh, project uh, and it's very kind of like stable. So how does Readme works these days? So lots of projects are being hosted on GitHub. So they are applying text file, but when users go to GitHub, GitHub kind of convert this plain text file to something uh, more nicely to read. And the same thing happens with GitLab. It converts all the readme to something that's a little bit nicer to read. Now, what the readme should have. Uh, so it should tell us what this project is. So I'm going to be using a few examples online. Uh, so in this example from Google Sheets 4, it tells that it, this package in this case provides an R interface to Google Sheets using the Google API. Uh, so it's a very brief description and it's nice to be brief so people can get very fast. One important thing is if at some point the project get deprecated or abandoned, then you sh the readme should also reflect this. It will help a lot of users to know. Uh, what else the readme should have? Uh, it should tell who the users are. So again, as an example, the Google Sheets 4. Uh, from the overview, you know that it's targeting R users and Google Sheets users. So if I'm a Python users, this is not for me. If I'm uh, Office 365, this is also not for me. Uh, another example, uh, a little bit longer uh, later, uh, in another project, they also mention like API tokens. So this also tells the user that they should be a little bit familiar on how to get API tokens in self just open the browser. And this can be explained to a little bit more details of what the user should have some previous experience with. And what else they should, the readme should have? Uh, they also should tell the reader how to get started with the project. So for example, it should mention installation. Uh, in this case, again, from Google Sheets, it provides two ways to install. So to install using CRAN or to install using DevTools. Uh, it can be quite long, some installations each. Uh, rules depending because they're trying to cover for all different uh, operation systems and types of machines. But it's nice to keep it very briefly on the readme, but not hide any details. Otherwise, people might get a little bit frustrating or think that it's very easy to install, but at the end, they just spend hours. So I have a, my own personal frustration once that I was trying to install something that's supposed to be easy, as they say on the readme, but was not. But that's for another time. And as I say, not only installations, but how they should use the package. So again, from Google Sheets 4, so how do you read the data from Google? So here it provides our example. So in telling that, the main read function will help you and is similar to other functions that do similar things. Uh, so one point when you're talking about installations and how to use it is that what should goes on the readme and what should goes on another documentation. Uh, readme is not the only documentation that your project should have. The readme should be quite since small so you must have a more comprehensive documentation somewhere else. Depending on your project, this documentation might be auto-generated. 
and we place it on Reader Docs or not a uh, website. So for example, the Google Sheets 4 that I'm having to using as most of the examples, it has a readme, has some information, but it also has their own documentation website, which has the list of all the functions and the of information of what functions do, what is the inputs and outputs. Uh, so that's the end of my slides. Uh, Easter is coming in a few weeks, so I want to just wish you a very, very soon Easter with a lot of chocolates and celebrations. So I stopped sharing and some people might have questions. Thank you so much, Ranieri. Can we just have a quick round of applause uh, for our first speaker of the day? <laughs> Thank you, folks. Um, so, Ranieri, we have a few questions. I think we have one that's quite plus one, which, um, and we probably don't have time for a bunch. So I'm going to go for one question and then just ask if you can answer the rest in the etherpad. Yeah, um, I will do my best. But uh, line 201, how would you apply readme's to non-technical projects? So you should tell, uh, translate all the, those three key points to non, your non-technical project. So tell what your project is, what you're trying to achieve. Or this, There's a few different uh, words that you can use. You can say what's your goal or what's your mission. Uh, second, you should tell what's your audience. Uh, so what contributors you're looking for. So if you're looking for people from biology or if you're looking for people uh, from art or social science uh, and what expertise people will, uh, should be contributing. So you're looking for marketing or promotion or uh, uh, mentors. And the third one is how to get engaged. So are you using Discord or using Slack or using another web forum or you're meeting in person? So that will be the key points for a non-technical project. Thank you. Um, I like how you loop back and point out that the same three questions can have very different answers, uh, no matter what the project shape may be. Um, so there are a few more questions still coming in, I think, which is great. Um, but unfortunately, for the sake of time, and so our other two speakers don't get frustrated if they, they, they get their time squeezed. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to move on. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, the invitation. One other note I have is around about line 220, folks, if you have any tips for a readme um, that you think you would like to share, please add them in, line 220. That is completely optional. Uh, we do next have a set of breakout rooms. We're looking at about seven minutes um, of breakout rooms here. Look at the um, vision statement that you've been working on, um, perhaps before the call, or um, if not, very quickly, do so now. Um, and have a look at Upgoer 5. Uh, there's a link, this is line 232. Um, and the idea is that the Upgoer 5 actually um, forces you to think about the language that you're using and whether it may be challenging to people. Um, so Upgoer 5 in itself might be a challenging word because in fact, there's no word for rocket that's very commonly used. So they went for up and goer, um, which is why it's called that. Um, so I find this exercise really interesting because I definitely would not use the vision statement that I've plugged into the app Goa 5 because it becomes almost incomprehensible because I'm actually using such simple words. However, it does sort of reveal the point that there are pain points around words that can be difficult for people to understand. Um, so we have roughly seven minutes, three people per room, discuss how your vision statement has worked after you've put it in there and whether or not you've gotten confused completely. Um, there is also the Hemingway editor. I don't know if anyone has a minute. I will add it in a, a link around about line 235 as well. That doesn't go for quite such simple words. Um, is what we're doing in the breakout rooms clear? I've got nods. I love nods. Thank you. And Malvika, are we ready to go into the rooms?
That's a yes. I look like an oh, are we? Give me 30 <laughs> seconds. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. Um, if you haven't started yet, hop into the Upgoer 5, paste your vision statement or write it in there right now whilst we're stalling for time to get those break breakout rooms ready. Opening the ah. room. I hope Perfect. I've done all right, but if someone got allocated to wrong room, please stay back and we'll put you to the right room. for different um, approaches might be useful here. So sometimes have it for the target audience and sometimes have it in, you know, um, simpler language is all, all reasonable approaches. Um, we have some amazing stuff going on in the uh, chat about things being written to be written, not written to be read, um, and sharing your vision um, and suggestions for other people's vision uh, where you think it can be simplified. Um, Luke, it was lovely to have you here uh if you haven't dropped off already <laughs> okay we do need to move on uh so thanks everyone who's been writing and sharing reflections feel free to add any in the etherpad roundabout line 246 uh, but maya next section is yours so we uh continue and now we will have um how yeah talking us uh, through a primer and open licenses so please how Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see if my screen sharing is working. Can you all see that? Okay. Um, so yeah, I am going to talk to you for the next 10 minutes or so about open licenses. Um, briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Hao Yi. I am the reproducibility librarian uh, at the University of Florida. So I do a lot of training and instruction on research reproducibility and open practices. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, so the purpose of this section and the purpose of licenses are to enable other people to use, share, remix um, the work that you are doing on your project. Um, and I think collectively, um, people in this space who like to work openly want we want our work to have an impact we want it to be you know building on the work of others to be a foundation for other work to come later um, and licenses are really important for making sure that that is possible um, and so kind of the outcomes of establishing the license for a project is to make it so that other people can use remix and share it uh a reminder uh that none of this is really legal advice uh i i'm not a lawyer in any area of the world um and so if you have kind of very specific concerns about copyright or patents uh, i would encourage you to uh contact uh an expert um which may or may not be a lawyer depending on where you are Okay, so um, linking this back to the, the open leadership framework, open leaders design and build projects that empower others to collaborate within inclusive communities. Uh, so I think of licenses as fitting really best in this space where we are trying to build our projects in a way that promotes sharing. Some of the common misconceptions about licenses that I wanted to address up front. Um, you know, sharing something on the internet uh, does not automatically allow other people to use the content or to remix the content. If you are creating a work and you are sharing it with a license, that doesn't automatically prevent you from publishing that work or selling it or using it for something else. And if you are sharing something uh, with an open license, um, reusing or remixing it, uh, without attribution can be legal depending on the license, um, but in a kind of academic setting where we are expected to cite uh, and acknowledge prior work, that can still be a violation of academic ethics. So I, I work a lot with academics, and so there's, there's always some concern with open licenses that 
uh, it means that they their work won't be cited. Uh, and that's not the case. Uh, that citation practice is still uh, a form of academic misconduct if the work is cited. So I um, thought I'd start by introducing a hypothetical scenario to kind of ground these concepts. So I imagine I collect data uh, about some preferred Kit Kat flavors, um, just some, you know, some, some data set, and I want to make it openly available. Uh, and I store this data file on a public GitHub repository. If I don't apply a license to the data, legally, it's not possible for anyone else to use the data, for example, in an analysis paper uh, to combine it with some other data sets and, and publish an aggregated data set uh, or kind of reshare the data without my permission, right? Uh, they can still link the, the GitHub repository, but they can't like take the file and then reshare it themselves. So what I need to do if I want other people to be able to use it is to give permission uh, whenever someone asks uh, or permanently gives specific permissions to everyone, right? So that is if someone wants to use this data for a specific purpose, I have to explicitly give them permission to do so. Uh, and that can be tedious. And so one way to solve this problem is to create a specific license that just grants the permissions I want to give to everyone. So some of the common elements of open licenses, uh, we want people to be able to use the work. We want people to be able to modify the work. We want people to be able to share and redistribute the work. So those are all elements that go into kind of the specific permissions that we want to give other people um, in their licenses. So first step, how do you choose a license? Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that there are different types of work that you may be doing um, in your projects. And so different licenses will give different permissions uh, that are specific to those types of work. Right, so you may have data that you're sharing or code that you're sharing or creative works in your project that you're sharing. Um, these generally are going to require different licenses to give the same kinds of permissions to those different types of work. And then you also wanna think about kind of what uses are you allowing in uh, the reuse of your work, right? So do you want your work to be available to be used for commercial purposes? Uh, do you want your work to be able to be shared in a modified format? Uh, do you want derivative works to be shared, to be able to be shared under different licenses? And so these are all some specific considerations for thinking about, you know, your selection of licenses. Um, we don't really have time to go into a whole lot of detail here. Uh, so I'll give you some general suggestions at, at the end about open licenses and which ones to use. And then finally, we want to talk about attribution and credit. Uh, so most open licenses are going to require other people to credit the authors or the original copyright holders of the work. Uh, the primary exception here is if you want something that you're doing to be in the public domain and you're applying uh, like the Creative Commons Zero license uh, that basically releases that work publicly uh, and it can be used without citing the original authors. So that was all about kind of decision points for choosing a license. Uh, next, I want to talk about how you implement a license. So uh, some general tips for, for applying a license in your uh, main project folder in the root directory. Uh, licenses are usually done um, as a file, uh, plain text file uh, named license. And you can include multiple licenses uh, for different pieces of your project, right? So if you have software or writing or data sets in your, all in your project at once, um, you uh, can have different licenses for those different pieces. Uh, and you just want to be explicit about which license applies to which files. Um, and you can do this either uh, in the license file directly or in your README that describes which license applies to which parts of your project. 
If you're working in GitHub and you have a new GitHub repository, uh, you may have seen that in the options for creating a new repository, you can choose a license. Uh, you can click the checkbox there. Uh, and there's a little pull down menu where you can select some of the common licenses that are built into GitHub. Or if you have an existing GitHub repository, uh, if you try and add a new file um, and you start writing the name of the file license, um, you, it'll actually, GitHub will show a, a button that allows you to choose a license template. Uh, and so that can be really an easy way to add a license if you already have an existing GitHub project. So to summarize, um, you need a license <laughs> to allow other people to build off your work. Um, you'd want to use a different license for code, data, and different kinds of content. Um, my kind of recommendations that also follow other kind of recommendations about working openly. Uh, there are some good permissive defaults uh, that you can use if you don't have specific concerns, uh, which are to share code with the MIT license, uh, to share writing and documentation and images using the Creative Commons attribution license. Uh, and to share data using the Creative Commons Zero license, uh, which is releasing the data set into the public domain. Okay, so I think I will stop here and take questions. Thank you, Harold, for such a, a brief and dense uh, presentation. And we do have questions. And one, uh, I'd like to voice take one uh, that is. Well, thank you for clapping. Yes, I think we should also uh, do some clapping uh, for our second speaker. <laughs> um, and the question is, I also have this question, can we change the license of the repo once this is created? How might this affect people who have already cloned this repo? This is in line 270. That's a, like, I, it's an interesting question and it, it, it can get a little bit tricky. Um, I don't know that there is enforcement of, you know, making sure there is backwards compatibility in licenses. Um, if you are like the, the owner of the work, you can, you can always re-release the work under a different license. Um, that doesn't all that doesn't apply to kind of the work that you have already released in a prior version under a different license, but that history can be lost if it's you know just like a GitHub repository where you have changed the files and changed the license. Um, so so that can that can be that can be really tricky, um, and there are some conflicts uh, with with you know kind of what you have what rights you have released publicly in the past and then kind of what changes you have made. Um, so it, it is possible, but it can be tricky. Usually it's, it's much easier to go from a more restrictive license to a more open license, like you give more permissions later on than it is to try and take uh, an, a more open license initially and then try and take some, add more restrictions to it later. Right, that was helpful. We have a question from Gemma, Hema. Yeah, no, because I just wanted to comment because it was me who wrote that question in the in the chat. Um, so uh, because our problem, and it's great that you're here because we've been having this discussion because we really stand there an MIT, but we actually think we want everyone to keep open any modifications they do. So we were thinking of switching to a GPL3. And like, I think outside the organization, there is like two people that have cloned this repo from other organizations. So we just contact them and then switch the license on GitHub. Would this be like a major bad practice thing to do or because it's very new, it shouldn't be too difficult? I think it happens a lot. I would, I mean, if it's software, my main suggestion would be to increment the version number and indicate in the documentation that previous versions were released under this license. Versions from this point forward are using, you know, GPL or whatever it is you're using, and that will make it, you know, kind of really clear when that break is happening. All right. Thank you for clearing doubts and anxieties. 
we are getting some other questions, but I would suggest for the sake of time, we would uh, move to the, to the Ethropod um, answering. Uh, thanks again, Hao. Thanks for the questions from the participants. And now we move to the next section. I'll give the microphone to Malvika. Thank you, Maya. Um, so we've, I'm just going to review what we've done this morning. We've done README. So you are telling people what your project is about. We learned about licensing. So you're telling people how they can use your project like. But now we're going to move on to who are these people? How do we want them to participate in the project that we are building? How could they contribute in the repository or online resources we are developing? And for that, I want to invite Sarah Stams to talk to us about contributing guidelines and code of conduct. Thank you so much, Malvika. I'll now speak a bit about the importance of contributing guidelines and of having a clear code of conduct for your project. Um, the important thing to bear in mind is that you as a project leader are trying to build a community around your project. Um, you're trying to attract volunteers to your project. Um, and sorry, before I get started, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Sarah Stamps again. I'm an associate professor for uh, Virginia Tech. Um, and there's my social media links if you'd like to connect. Um, so yeah, um, it's very, it is very important to uh, bear in mind that as a project leader, you're trying to build a community around your project and you're trying to attract volunteers to your project. Um, and, these will and these people will have diverse backgrounds and come into your project with different expectations. Um, sorry, I was just checking the chat. Um, if, if not, it's um, so you as the project leader, you do need to take initiative with regards to what culture you want your project to have. And if not, a culture uh, will develop without you. So this means you need to make some conscious choices regarding how you want your community to be and what values um, your community should advocate and how you want people to behave with each other and with others. So I'm going to go through a couple of things in this presentation. Um, I first want you to consider how to create a, pot a positive culture for your contribution and collaboration on open projects. And then I'm gonna give you a couple practical examples like um, how to draft a contributing.md file and then um, choosing a code of conduct for your project. So what is project culture? Um, you you wanna build a community um, again, your community has diverse members. Ideally, um, you want to help build and guide this culture as the leader and definitely make some conscious decisions, as I said previously. Um, so you want to put out there for your, for your team and for people on your project, the values and how people should behave. So the thing to remember here is that a project is more than its goals. It's a language, a shared set of norms, people's expectations, um, the tools, how decisions are made, the project identity. Um, this figure on the right shows a, you know, that there's a lot more to collaboration than you might think. And I encourage you to have, have a good look at this image because there's some good information there. Um, it's by the Turing Way and Scriberia. So how do you go about shaping the culture you want? Um, there's kind of two big things that can be done. You can make contribution guidelines that are very clear and you can develop a code of conduct that is enforced. So these are two very important vehicles that will help you as a project leader communicate to your community how you want your community to be. Okay, so, um, you know, when you think of community, what do we think about? You know, what's, what's the motivation? Um, how do we identify uh, what the particular roles in a community? Um, is it distributed leadership? Um, is it kind of a top-down organization? How is your project going to survive? And, um, you know, how, how will it be sustained into the future? Uh, so what we're trying to do is get people to contribute to your project. Um, in this context, it is very important to remember that your contributors are people with their own worldviews and their own histories. So we need to take this into consideration when we're trying to build a welcoming atmosphere so that people want to contribute. Um, I have an example here of a project called Aspect that's a geodynamics software code um, that developed um, over the past 10 or 15 years 
And now they have uh, numerous contributors as they've grown in their community, um, which is, this is one community I'm a part of as well. Um, so here is, uh, here is an example of the contributing markdown file from Aspect. Contributing, uh, uh, creating a contributing markdown file in your GitHub repository is important and you want to make it clear um, how one can contribute to your project. These are readily available within each repo. Make sure that they're readily, readily available within each repo for each set of uh, materials so that people can easily find the contributing uh, markdown file. Um, and it should include some information um, about like the structure of contributions and you, you wanna provide the guidelines, standard style. Um, this helps to improve efficiency and involve new people. And the people who um, are owners, you know, there's people that are owners of the project, there's contributors, and there's also consumers who are users and members. Um, so the kind of information that your contributing dot mark, your markdown file for uh, contributing could contain um, is, you know, what people can do to con contribute, for example. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Um, so here's one from the Turing Way. Um, this one's pretty comprehensive. Um, we have this, this project has information about how to join the community um, throughout events, how to get in touch, and then how to interact with the project throughout the GitHub repository, um, as this is how people make contributions to the Turing way. A different flavor of a contributing file, which is for aspects, um, which is uh, software, it's, it includes these sections, like getting started with Git and GitHub. It actually provides some educational materials, um, asking and answering questions about aspect, bug reports, making the code better, how to open pull requests, the conventions of uh, the code, uh, change log entries, and then acknowledgement of contributions. So these are all part of uh, the, re the contributing markdown file for aspect. Uh, the Carpentries has a community page on their website, which details how to get in touch with various parts of this project. Uh, so this is a screenshot from one of the Carpentries pages, and the link is here as well, if you want to see that. Um, so, okay, now we're going to move on to the issue of code of conduct. Um, the basis for this is that we have a well-functioning community, we need to take into consideration um, that the other people in this project are not carbon copies of ourselves. So if you're lucky, you'll be able to build a diverse community for your project, a diversity of people and opinions. Um, they always make projects stronger and help them to be original and adaptable to different contexts. Um, so this is an example of a wonderful community um, from CarpentryCon in 2018. So the issue then becomes, you know, what if something happens in your in your community that shouldn't? So what if some something turns the wrong way? And this is where the code of conduct um, becomes very important. So here's a definition for code of conduct. Uh, it's a set of rules outlining the social norms, rules, and responsibilities of an individual project, party, or organization. Um, a code of conduct speaks to uh, what is accepted and what is not what to do when something not accepted happens as well. So a code of conduct has three big things. Um, and you know, do you really need a code of conduct? Yes, definitely. Um, so the code of conduct invites people to your project. It sets clear expectations for community members. And it, uh, last but not least, and probably the most important, it tells people that you care about your community and that community culture is important to you. So here are some examples of code of conducts, and uh, we're gonna look at just an example one as well. Um, so these are all linked, and they're also linked in the Etherpad. I've added uh, a couple. I even added the one for my research group, the Geodesy and Tectonophysics Laboratory. Uh, so we spent about nine months working on our code of conduct, but it's done, and we're kind of happy about it. Um, all right, so here's an example of a code of conduct from a workshop I helped organize just last week. Um, so code of conduct, uh, this again, this was for a workshop, but there's a, quite a wide variety of them. Um, uh, people are welcomed. Um, then um, there's some examples of expected behavior. 
And then um, it's not a box checking item, like it tells you what's unacceptable, as well as the consequences. So there, there does need to be some uh, consequences for if you, uh, if you violate the code of conduct. All right, so in order to get started with a code of conduct, um, you need to think about brainstorm some core words that represent community values, consider behaviors to encourage and discourage, uh, think through a process for incidents and complaints. Um, what are consequences for those acting outside of the norms? Understand and accept your role as a project lead. And then I uh, would suggest that you find examples from which to build your code of conduct. A couple of tips and takeaways. I'm about to wrap up. So encourage and reward good practice. Designate a code of conduct and safety committee. Make sure that your code of conduct is posted, visible, and clear. Communicate process to contributors and then revise an existing code of conduct because there are some really great ones out there. Um, so I um, you know, want to thank you for your, um, giving me the opportunity to give this presentation. And I hope that we'll think about what open science dreams you will achieve. Thank you so much, Sarah. Can we have a round of applause for Sarah? Um, we've, we've had lots of notes and also lots of questions. And I'm going to actually start with first question by Laura Asion. Uh, do you know of any code of conduct that includes restorative justice as an approach to address COC, the code of conduct? Also, any example of COC that did not stand started from COC model from Global North? So um, I think this is a conversation for, for later, but I am really glad that Laura has put that, that in, in the page. I had a back channel chat with Laura. The reason she put it there is that we, she wants us to consider that code of conduct can be very contextualized based on where you are. So if you're using someone else's code of conduct, reflect on it, how it applies to your own world uh, is that, yeah, Laura is shaking her head, but please do talk about this on Slack. Um, this is very important to us. But next question for Sarah, how often something wrong happens actually, and you have to go to code of conduct and actions? Well, if it's okay, I'd like to address that first question as well. Um, so I have developed a code of conduct for Uganda, like actually doing field work in someone else's countries. And we took uh, a lot of time putting in the code of conduct kind of expected behavior for that country. And there was even a section on relevant laws, you know, that you need to be aware of um, because it is a very different culture than in the US where most of us are. Um, so, you know, do the research, you know, make sure that you know what the customs are and add a section, you know, like expected behaviors in this country and um, things you should be really aware of um, if, you're, if you're going somewhere else. Um, and then the other question was about how often have I dealt with violations or how often do violations happen? I, I mean, in general, I would say it's rare. I'm on the, I'm now on the Carpentries Code of Conduct Committee and they've also communicated that it's rare that they, that they get violations, uh, but having the committee to, to deal with it and, and to, um, to figure out the best solution uh, for handling a code of conduct report is, is super important. And then um, I wanted to also mention that in another code of conduct that I helped work on, it's the EarthCube code of conduct or community participation guidelines. We started with the Mozilla guideline, or no, it was Mozilla. And then those were modified for ESIP, which is an earth science informatics community. And then we took those and modified those for EarthCube. And we have, uh, we actually, contracted a company, I think in Canada, to, um, to accept anonymous re reports for violations of the code of conduct. And then, so that way it takes out the people who might be involved in the community. And then it's, and then it's kind of, it goes down the path of, you know, who, who should and should not, should not be involved. I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you, Sarah. And I believe the, the link to your code of conduct is in the slide. If not, we can definitely curate that and add in the Etherpad because it sounds like a fantastic balance between what we know and what is local. Um, 
Oh, so for that one, that one was for a specific project. It's for my dryer project. Um, if you want to see that one, I'll need to take out some contact information because because as part of it, like we made it for the team. Um, so it does have contact information in it, but it, I would love to share that because um, that one took us about three months. <laughs> that one was not quite as long, uh, but let me let me redact it to take out people's personal information and then I can share it. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, one more question. I think we still have time. What type of consequences for breach are common in code of conduct? And have you seen any noble ones in projects? What, okay, well, let me just repeat the question. What type of consequences for breach, for breaching the code of conduct are common? And have you seen any novel ones in projects? Um, breaches in code of conduct, uh, I mean, what we've done is said like people could be dismissed from a group. Um, they could, um, yeah, I don't, uh, I haven't actually had to deal with a breach in the code of conduct. And I, I would kind of need to review the, what we said we would do, but a lot, a lot of it is, is like, um, leaving the community or, or if you, if you're, if it's, if it's at an event, you know, you might have to leave the event itself. Um, some other consequences are like getting reported to another authority. Because for example, one code of conduct is, um, for a, a research group. And so there's really no power in the research group. Like if something seriously happens, you need to report that to the higher ops. So that's another possible consequence. Um, as far as novel ones, um, I don't really know of any novel ones. Maybe write an essay. I would, I would actually consider having students write essays if they violated the code of conduct. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to add, uh, Sarah, you and I are now in the Carpentry School of Conduct and we're going to explore lots of questions. If you have new ones, please tell me. But some of my experience with code of conduct breaches are that often they are not code of conduct breaches. They are uh, things that people can manage within the project that they are working on. Uh, it is mostly about, you know, making sure that people have ways to share if there is a discomfort that they have experienced where the organizers can take some actions. Um, often, you know, listening to people is really important. And these are the places to be listened to and provide support, whoever needs it. Uh, one thing that I would also flag that try to understand different points of view. Sometimes you, we may feel offended by something and offense doesn't mean it's a code of conduct breach. But having said that, of course, code of conduct breach happens and we should not discount that. It's not about the intention that I didn't mean to offend you, but it's about the consequence that someone got hurt and that's where you need to support them. So it's quite, it's a theory. It's gonna take a lot of time for us to really understand, even as we say, we work in code of conduct committees, but Sarah, thank you so much for bringing that rich experience and that discussion here. Um, I hope people can reach you by email. Uh, we have we have it in the etherpad. All right, folks, we are almost at the end. I'm gonna pass it to you to wrap it up. Thank you so much. I really quickly wanna add that one consequence I've seen of a code of conduct breach is systems put into place to prevent that particular thing happening again, uh, which I think is really important. So remember, it's not just about the person who did the thing, but also about the systems that allowed it. But anyway, we're wrapping because we are at the half hour. So um, you have watched three presentations where we have talked a lot about GitHub and you have said, maybe, do I have to use this? What is this? Don't worry. Next week, we will have a GitHub session where we will talk about GitHub. We will talk about how to use it, how to interact with it um, and ways to make it easier. We will also teach you how to make a website for your project as part of this. So it is a nice little session, 90 minutes. It's optional. You don't have to come if you don't want. If you can't make it and you'd still like some help, we can still help you. Um, GitHub is not required. It's merely that when you are putting all of your stuff online and available, it's nice to have some place to put it that is collaborative and easy for other people to pitch in. 
Um, and with that, we have some assignments. So if you're looking at the Etherpad right now, line 326 onwards, we say create a GitHub repository for your project. Add a link to your repository in the issue that you've probably created over the last week or so on GitHub. Um, and perhaps start putting some of your files like readmes, codes of conduct, etc., into that repository. Um, and if you're stuck at any point, speak with your mentor, ask in the Slack channel, we can help you. Um, we know that this is not one size fits all and that it will vary from project to project. Some projects are code and technical, some projects are event-based, some projects are about writing something or creating a community space. Um, so things will vary from place to place. Um, the other thing that you have next week is you have your mentor mentee call. Um, but take a look at the assignments, um, do what you can, discuss what you're confused about. And I think that's everything for now. If you have any feedback, then lines 340 onwards is where you can write it. And have a beautiful day. We love you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll see you around.